Hi, hello everyone and welcome to my channel in this encounters with inspiring and beautiful minds and please think of liking and subscribing so that you too maybe can become part of this process of spreading ideas and truths and tools that can bring more beauty and meaning to our lives. And if you're interested in spreading your message uh, out there, please write me and let's create this network of meaningful conversations and learn more about how to use our own mind, our own body our own abilities and skills. And today my guest is Dick Harbers, Master NLP Practitioner. Dick, welcome to my show. Thank you very much. I'm so happy. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so Nick has, uh, uh, is a Master NLP Practitioner for more than 35 years, and he focused mainly on therapeutic interventions in a clinical practice in the lovely tropical city of Cairns. Am I pronouncing it correctly? That's correct. In Australia. And he developed a powerful personal knowing program, which he called Quantum Healing. So you mentioned that uh, you developed it two weeks before Deepak Chopra's book by the same name. <laughs> now, now, I named it two weeks before. It, it took quite a long time to develop. Yes. But once I realized it was going to be a quite a comprehensive program, I ch had to choose a name. And uh, then I chose a name two weeks before I, uh, I saw the book had just come out half two weeks later. So it was interesting. Very interesting indeed. Yeah. I can't wait to talk a little bit about that. And so now you are semi-retired in the Philippines and you use, right. the, uh, use this pandemic self-isolation self period to write up uh, your work. So you are uh, posting some of these trans transcripts in um, and this uh, McKenna Bandler NLP community group as a form of self-publishing and peer reviews. So that's great. Um, Dick, we met, we met last week to know each other a little bit and we had yep. a great chat and we touched so many interesting subjects uh, such as your quantum healing, working with the timeline, reframing inner chat, uh, work with beliefs and also about the REM, the rapid eye movements, uh, healing your own chronic anxiety. Um, so I know this hour will go very fast. And uh, before getting into the area of ex expertise, what brought you into the NLP? I'm curious about that. Well, uh, as a child, I was quite an anxious child, which came out in that story of uh, resolving my own chronic anxiety state. And I was, I was an anxious child, I think, because at the age of four, coming from uh, war-torn Europe, my parents decided to leave such a, it was a terrible situation. And they got a uh, assisted passage to Australia. But for, for a little four-year-old, of course, I had to go from not knowing any language and not knowing any people, and then because my father had to find work and change uh, locations quite often, I, I also went to many schools in my younger years, so I never really developed any lasting friendships. And uh, I overlaid that eventually through teenage years with um, <clears throat> a layer of stoic, like a cover of stoicism to, to protect me from that anxiety state and also prevented me from really accessing many emotional states consciously. So eventually I worked uh, that out. Um, that um, that was not a good way to be and there were quite a few other life experiences which of course brought that, that to the surface. My um, first marriage, my, my wife at the time, she decided she I wasn't for her after all and um, coming from a situation in my time that you know, marriages last forever. So when that didn't happen, that sort of blew apart that, that paradigm. So you know, that immediately started a journey of looking at what it was about me that contributed to that situation. We remained quite amicable friends, so it was a, an amicable split, uh, but nevertheless was quite, um, it brought up all those emotions I'd been suppressing. So then I went through quite a deal of different therapies to explore that, because I had no idea how to do that. And one of them was Gestalt, which was fascinating, which of course, Bandler and Brenda and the others um, modeled Fritz Perls with Gestalt. And um, I went through a few interesting processes in a four-week residential workshop with that. It's fascinating. Uh, but eventually I came across a program called the, through the Self Transformation Centre in Sydney that had a life repair workshop. I thought that sounds about right for me. <laughs> and um, in that particular program, they did some basic, very basic NLP techniques, one of which was reframing. Mm -hmm. and 
and we had to do a little exercise with three people, the usual thing in NLP, you know, observer, therapist, client sort of thing. And I was a therapist in this particular one. And my client wanted to lose weight by eating less. And in my mind, she didn't need to lose weight, but it was, she was a client and I was a therapist. So I basically read the transcript of the reframing without really understanding why I would do that. And this was on a Sunday evening of the weekend program and our next meeting was Wednesday evening, so three days later. And when we met on Wednesday, I said, how's it going? She said, she said Dick, I haven't eaten a thing for three days. Please undo this, what you did. <laughs> and I said, well, they didn't tell us how to do that, but I'll do it backwards and we'll see what happens, which I did. And at the end of the evening, we had a coffee and she had some cakes so as she was eating again. So I thought, isn't that amazing? Here am I using some words, ordinary everyday English words in a particular way, and it has such an amazing impact on a person's behaviour. So from that I thought, and, and as a child, I remember uh, one of my favourite comic strips was Mandrake the Magician. All he used to do was use words and gestures, and they used to fascinate me. And then I thought, that's what I just did with this woman. Words, mainly some gestures. So then, then I decided to sign up for an NLP training program with a, a very good trainer called Terry McClendon in Australia, who had worked initially with Bandler and Grinder way back. Uh, so he was quite experienced. And um, during that program, in the first uh, segment or the first half period of that program, again we revisit, revisited reframing in more detail and more skill. And just after that, I was walking back towards the venue for a, after lunch and I started to have a little chat with my chronic anxiety state because I finally worked out what it was. A turmoil in the stomach and sort of a sour feeling and a yeah. internal dialogue. Yeah. And um, so I simply said to it, hi, what are you doing down there? To the anxiety? Yeah, All right. so I'll have a talk to her, to befriend her. Because most of us in our society, we, we make all these negative emotions wrong. And NLP has a concept of everything has good intent or positive intent. So yeah. I thought, well, let's see if this anxiety state has a positive intent. So I was, I was in a semi-trance, I guess, or a daydreaming as I was walking along. And I said, uh, hi, anxiety state, what are you doing there for so long? And it simply said, we've got, we've got we, plural, we've got to look after you. I said, oh, how long have you been doing that? Since you were four years old. Oh, interesting. I said, well, thanks for doing that for me. It's very kind of you, but I'm an adult now and I don't need your help in that way. I've learned a lot of things. I've done a lot of things I need to do to deal with my um, emotional things and um, I'm sure I can manage. Would you like to have a holiday? I said, oh, that'd be great, but no, no, you might need it. I said, well, maybe I will, but I don't feel I do at the moment. So how about you go on a holiday and I'll give you a pager to take with you. So this was pre-mobile -mo pre phone days. The pages had just been come out, sort of electronic beepers. I said, oh, that's a good idea, but the battery might go flat. <laughs> so I so, said, well, I'll give you a brand new battery. They will last for 18 months, the energizers. And if, um, if you want, you can come back in a year's time and visit me to see if I'm doing okay. And if I need you, I will pay you. And it said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. I think I will have a holiday. The first holiday in what would have been 40 years or something. So I said, well, thanks very much. Have a great time and see you later. And the anxiety state just disappeared and the internal dialogue, the negative internal dialogue went with it. There and then, instantaneously. It did. I mean, it for did. the whole period of time. Well, interestingly enough, it, came, it comes back once a year, regular as clockwork, Checks in, see if I need it. I was back this year again in March, just briefly. Sees I'm okay, have a chat to it, and off it goes on its extended holiday. 
Do you think there's still a, a positive intention behind it? Well, it was, it, 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 its function was to look after me, to, to take care of me because I was an anxious child. You know, I, I was in difficult, like I was, there's a bit of bullying at school. There was, so the way it, that was its intention to somehow look after me. So I've been able to go on holidays more comfortably. I've got more energy to do other things because the energy is not going into anxiety about anything. I still can get anxious, but only for things that are immediately necessary. So if I'm in a traffic situation, maybe, or um, you know, well, there's an altercation going on, I get a bit not. I don't get anxious in a, in a debilitating way, but just to be alert and make sure that everybody's safe and things like that. So, uh, for somebody listening now who's dealing with uh, chronic anxiety, if they attempt to have this short inner dialogue with it, and it doesn't stop, and they cannot get to negotiate uh, the terms and conditions that easily, what would you recommend? That they continue the dialogue, that they do it often? That, um... Well, fir first they need to check that they suspend all judgment. Suspend all judgment. So a lot of people don't do that. And uh, they also have to become like a, a, a disassociated observer of the anxiety state. Mm -hmm. so in some ways I could disassociate and have a chat as if I was talking to somebody else. It was just an adult to adult chat. Even though the anxiety state started when I was four, we were chatting as adults. Um, so that, that's two things that are important. Uh, since I did that and, and subsequent to my ongoing uh, learning, I also learned that partly through reframing uh, to also when you just have a chat to the parts of a person which is reframing is to some degree about, is that every time they give you a response, you thank them thank that part of giving that response. And so as, as I did more and more of that, I started to notice that when you thank something, it responds. When you thank something, it responds. It responds. doesn't matter what the response is, it's a response. Our body responds when we thank it. If we thank our lungs for breathing, you'll notice you suddenly do a deeper breath automatically. Right? If you thank your feet for walking, you'll notice your feet are suddenly a bit more alive, a bit more energy in your feet, automatically. Because scientists have discovered that every, th every thought in your brain creates chemicals, and there are receptor cells right throughout your body for all those chemicals. And when you focus on any part of your body, that part of your body gets an extra dose of chemicals. And, and interesting, I'm from a Christian background, um, and in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, I think it is, there's a saying that says, in all things be thankful. Not in some things, not in, only in the good things, in all things be thankful. But it doesn't say the next bit. It doesn't then say, and then notice what happens when you thank it. And often in our interaction socially with people, we thank them, we don't check how they respond when we thank them. We just go off on some other topic. Or we're walking away when we thank them or something else like that. Right? So I discovered during the reframing as I was working with my, when I first started NLP playing with friends and family and things like that before I was a practitioner. And I started to notice when I got people to thank something they were working with, there was a response. So then I said, well, thank the response and notice what happens next. And then thank that, and then thank that response, and knows what happens next. And in some situations, if you do that over and over and over again, there's a journey goes on, often to resolution without any other intervention required. And again, one of my uh, transcripts tells a story of just exactly that happening. The whole process was simply resolved by noticing and thanking, noticing and thanking, noticing and thanking. We're not used to paying attention to the that which is going on inside of us, in our minds and our bodies. Right? And then we're not taught to then thank the response because that's the next step. It's almost like in a computer program hitting enter. The computer says, you want to do this? Enter. You sure you want to do this? Okay. Like it's just like a step by step by step by step by step process. And for certain things that's sufficient. Now it's not always a verbal response. It might be a, a feeling response in the body a sensation, an emotion. It might be a breath change. 
It might be a tingling of the feet. It might be an itch of the nose. It might be a, a thought in the mind. It might be a salvation in the mouth. There are, the body can respond in any of its sensory systems. Right? So and sometimes when you go through that thinking process, it'll jump from sensory system to sensory system. Sometimes. Sometimes it stays in the same sensory system. The trick is not to judge it, just to notice and accept the response. But in my experience, the system knows the exact next step that needs to happen. And sometimes the next step is absolutely nothing. Say so thanks to nothing. Or sometimes it's total silence. Say so thanks to total silence when there's been some sounds or tones or words before. Now, you also get a, quite a clear indication when it's all finished. Like the okay. person feels, ah, that's done. It's like, ah, like a release. It mightn't be a physical, ah, it might be, an, it might be like a bright, bright thought in your mind, really clear vision of something. Or it might be a little voice that says, that's done now. Like a, kinesthetics would feel it, you know. Auditories would have a voice. A visual would see a really clear indication that it's finished. So... You need, as you would know as a practitioner, master practitioner, that you need to be really cognizant of everybody's different representational systems at different stages through their process. So sometimes it's unprocessed stuff that gets us stressed and anxious. Because everything we see and hear and observe and experience all has to be processed. And um, in our culture, we're not taught to process. Now, if I can just ask you to close your eyes for a moment. Can you do that? Just close your eyes. Now, when you close your eyes, what do you notice your eyes are doing? That's right. Mm, they're kind of moving left to right. Yeah, like that's that. right. That's enough. That's good. You can open now. That's fine. So they start flickering. Flickering. The eyelids start flickering. Right? And that's called rapid eye movement because the eyes are flicking between all the eye sectors eye accessing Q sectors that NLP discovered. So they're going from visual recall to visual construct to auditory kinesthetic and, and they're constantly, it's all a big processing system. So often when people close their eyes, they may not be aware of that, but the eyes will be flickering. But if you thank your eyes and getting back to thanking process and invite them to process, they'll immediately start because the eyes are also responding to our thoughts. Every part of our body response to our thoughts, our requests. Some people say instructions, I prefer to make a request or an invitation. To me that seems more polite or courteous and I seem to get more results that way. Just the simple act of thinking even if I don't really mean it because you know, I could be in a very negative state or I could be in a, yep. in, a, in a lots of emotional pain and I don't really feel like thinking that, that emotion. Even if I do it automatically like this without really meaning it in the moment would it work yes yes okay it's, it's it's just the enter button on your computer on your on your computing system of your system your human operating system as an example of that i had a woman at a workshop who was a very strict catholic and she when uh, i suggest she thank what she knows oh, i can't thank myself not allowed to do that no 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 <laughs> I said, all right, then just say go or enter. And she did. And it worked. And again, and it worked. And again, and it worked. And then she said, oh, thank you. Once she got used to it, and then she allowed herself to say thank you. So it doesn't have to be the word thank you. Just that when you use thank you, it's, a, it's an expression of a uh, form of love called gratitude. Now, you don't actually have to mean it, that's true. But if you do mean it, actually, it has more impact. So basically, what I need to do is to take this time by myself, go in my room, sit somewhere quietly, and then do this consciously. Like, take the time to feel what's happening in there, and then say hmm. thank you, out loud or in my mind? Either way, it doesn't matter. Either way, it doesn't matter. And then I wait for a response. That's right. And then whatever shows up, I think that. That's right. Until I finally get a sense of relief and a sense of freedom or some sort of uh, clarity or, in my mind. Or you might start a discussion, a conversation. Okay. You will be guided by your system. 
guided if by it the comes back with a word or, or statement, you can you can start an auditory discussion with it. Internal dialogue or out, you know, sort of quietly to yourself, in whatever way people do that. It's uh, it's quite phenomenal. It's quite phenomenal. I'll try that. Then and how about the REM now? Bringing, bringing it back into the conversation. Can I add that into this process or are there two different things? It, you can because I would suggest you do whatever process you do as long as you're not driving a car or something serious with your eyes closed because you're not then distracted by the outer world and you're more likely to go internally and start to be more aware of and noticing more easily what's going on in, in your inner world. Um, but you can also ask your REM, your eyes, to support the process to help it, whatever it is that the emotion's about, to help process that, whichever it's about, because everything has to be processed, including emotional state. Basically, flickering means that I'm processing. Correct. All right. Very interesting. And, and mostly when you close your eyes, they start flickering, because you just heard something five minutes ago, you still have to process. So even when I'm talking to you now, your eyes are going to different places in your eye movements as you're processing what I'm saying. Yes. So you can do it eyes open. My mother would not close her eyes when I was doing a session with her in the early days. Uh, and she just would not close her eyes. I said, oh, that's okay. Just do it with your eyes open. So she, sta she was staring at a space and every second her eyes would blink. 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 So that was her processing mode. So it's not that you have to have your eyes closed. Of course, part of the quantum healing process, I also discovered that our phys physiological processes also respond to our thoughts. Not just our cells, not just our organs, like our healing process responds to our thoughts. And even the medical profession is starting to recognize that now. Our digestive process responds to our thoughts. So I had developed by then, by the time I got the IMAP stuff, I developed that one of the resources that we can access is our own inner healing resource, the body's natural healing processes. Now, we know if we cut a finger, what happens? It heals. Sure, it'll bleed for a while and you put a bit of dis disinfectant on it, but you know, a few days there's a scab and then it's within a week to 10 days it's healed. If we break a leg and it's set properly, it'll heal. It might take six weeks, but then it's almost as good as new. So I thought, well, that's interesting. And I started to think, well, why doesn't the body heal cancer? Why doesn't the body heal diabetes automatically? Why doesn't the body heal asthma automatically? And we could go on with a whole list of conditions that are so rampant in our culture. And I thought, well, the body will only heal things automatically that are immediately life-threatening. Because if you broke a leg, and in primitive days, if you couldn't hunt, you, you couldn't get your food, or run away from the tiger, or whatever was, was happening. So then I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder if the inner healer will heal some of these other conditions, which then I thought about what's the difference between a cut finger and a broken leg. And the difference is they were accidents. The others are lifestyle conditions either whether it's our personal lifestyle or our cultural lifestyle, like pollution in the air is a cultural lifestyle condition. So I thought, well, that's interesting. And uh, I started experimenting with inviting the inner healer to heal whatever need to be healing in some physiological conditions. And lo and behold, it did. Mostly, not always. And I, I wrote up a story, I think you've probably read about a man who had an emphysema for 40 years. He'd stopped smoking 20 years ago. His emphysema was still there. He was 80 years old. And he came to me. And my transcript is on the McKenna, uh, McKenna, uh, Bandler McKenna website. But basically what happened was I had a chat to him and suggested that maybe his body could heal that, just like he healed cuts and bruises, uh, yeah, bruises well, and, and broken bones. And that he did not intentionally mean to damage his lungs because in his day, smoking was normal and you know, thought it was healthy. So he wasn't intentionally trying to damage his body in any way. 
And so I just invite him just to close his eyes so we, his eyes could do rapid eye movement. I didn't talk about rapid eye movement to him. He didn't need to know that. And I just invite his inner healer to go through and do whatever it needs to do to heal the lungs. It's a bit more complicated than that, but th that's the basic process we use. And um, <clears throat> at the end of the process, he said, oh, it feels a bit better. Not sure. I said, that's okay. Just uh, get back to me when you notice something. Three weeks later, he rang the office and said, um, emphysema has gone for the first time in 40 years. Oh. And it happened a week It happened a week ago, but I didn't want to call you in case it was a false alarm. So he was very honest and very he was checking his undeniable reality state. Was this really true, this magical thing that had happened after 40 years? Because I talked to his lungs, which was because I said to him, your thoughts can affect your body, but if you and he said, I can't remember what you're going to say. I said, that's fine. I'll talk to your lungs for you. I'll talk to you in a healer on your behalf, and I'll have a discussion with him. And anything else we need to discuss. Is that okay? He said, yeah, it's good. So then I, I did the talking for him. Because not only do our thoughts impact on us, everybody else's thoughts, particularly if we hear the spoken word or see the, see the facial expression or the bodily postures or whatever it is, all those sorts of things. And even the non-spoken thoughts emanate from us and are transmitted, which we can start to access too as we get more and more into our own inner accessing capabilities. So uh, can so you please uh, describe more that inner healer? Like somebody who didn't well, have this notion before, what should I imagine? What do I think of when I think of the inner healer? What is it exactly? Well, it's different for everybody the way it presents itself. Mm -hmm. Now, we know the body's inner healer process in a scientific sense would, would activate all sorts of biochemical processes nutritional processes, excretory and getting rid of waste processes, all the repair processes, all that sort of thing. Now that's, that's scientifically and physiologically what's going on. But yes. for the mind, it's more like a metaphor. So in other words, I would ask a person to close their eyes and let's do it with you and see what happens. It might okay. take a minute. Okay. Okay, okay so just uh, in your mind, just for a start, just thank your conscious mind for noticing so many things very quickly and very easily. And now just notice what happens as I invite your being to bring to awareness the focus of energy, that's the focus of energy of your inner healer. As it comes to awareness, it could come as a, th a thought, a visual, picture or colour, could come as a feeling in your body, could come as a fragrance or a taste, it doesn't really matter. When the inner healer comes to awareness in whatever way it comes, just notice that. And when you notice, just thank it for coming to awareness in that particular way and notice how it responds to you. And when it's done that, and when you're ready, just allow your eyes to open and tell us what you experience. Take as long as you need. Oh, it's, ooh, it's nice, it's beautiful. Well, well uh, welcome back. What did you experience? It took it took some time, and I, I noticed my mind trying to find things, and I thanked Searching, my yeah. I thank my I thanked my mind for trying to find things, and I said I want, just want to listen. Thank you so much for doing that. And then I yep. after a while I felt my attention moving down towards the uh, my my chest in the middle of my heart. Yep. Yep. And then from there it was just like rays of light. So that's yep. that's the image that I had, and the feeling of very warming and powerful feeling. Did you thank it? I thank it for coming and for showing up, yes. And then and I how felt did it joy. <laughs> how did you feel joy? Okay, yes. that's right. So it res responded when you thanked it with that feeling it of joy. It responded when I, yeah. This, that's the feeling that I got when I thanked it. So, so that's your personal inner healer's uh, icon on your screen of consciousness. So it's like an icon on your computer screen. You touch that, you think that, that's your inner healer's access. The program of healing is accessed through that for you. Right? A friend of mine, he's got an image of a doctor. That's his inner healer. Another person has a beautiful color green. That's their inner healer. So it's different for everyone. Just like on a computer, icons can be totally different for the same programs. Right? I see. So you're telling me that basically we are uh, five or three, four questions away from our inner healer at any moment. Absolutely. 
Is that easy? It didn't take long. Wow. <laughs> and when I get it, what, what do I do? What's the next thing I should ask if I have? Well, you can ask it. You can ask it if you wanted to scan through your body and see if anything needs its attention at the moment. And if, it, if there is, just a let, let its loving, joyful, healing energy go to those parts of your body that specifically need it. And that's what I would do with the eye map. Once we'd worked out all the eye glitches, and right there in the healer, to go to the eye map and start healing what causes the eye map to be not working properly, not functioning properly, so that the, all the eye movements go back to the correct sectors for that person, and the movement, the eyes can move more and more freely through their pathways than they could before, so they can process more effectively. So we're going to ask you to go to specific things we're aware of, or we can just ask you to scan through and notice what needs to be addressed at the moment that we may not yet be aware of. So some people find going to places that they weren't aware needed healing, except they remembered a slight twinge there or something, but it was no longer consciously in the forefront of their mind. So <coughs> the inner healer will know exactly what to do and where to go, if it's ready and willing. I see. And able. And, and able. sometimes not. Sometimes, sometimes it's not, not able to? And whenever it's not able to, you thank it. You don't say, oh, yes, you can do it. You know how to do it. Come on, come on, you do it. Come on, come on, come on. You don't say that. You say, thank you for telling me you're not able. What do you need to be able you to do that? And then the inner healer will tell you what it needs so it can do its task. Because another resource might be required. And in the quantum healing process, there are seven resources. Now, there's many, many, many more than that. For the process of this, for the purpose of this process, those seven were sufficient. And I discover, though, each one in turn about three months to four months apart when the ones that we had up till then could no longer do it. So in other words, the issue we were dealing with was too complex for the current resources available. Now, that taught me something else. Because a lot of people get hung up about procrastination. The pro procrastination is a resource. It's telling you you don't have, have enough knowledge, skills, or resources yet to do that which you need to do. So you can ask your procrastinator, what other resources do I need? Please go and get them for me, if you can. Mm -hmm. And then so over about every four or five months, an extra resource would come until we had the seven. Then, if, then something in me said, that's the ones we need for now, for the purpose of the quantum healing process. Alignment, self-alignment, which is the first stage of the quantum human process. I won't go into all those now because that's a whole process. It's better to experience and just intellectualize about it. So as we thank, we love. As we thank, and we, we access love. I like, these. I like this, you know why? Because many people have hard time, and it's it's. You have to admit that it's uh, not easy to start to love something that you don't like in yourself. No. Because obviously, you don't like certain emotions, certain tendencies, certain. Um, emotional patterns that are there for a long time. You don't like them because they don't make you feel good. So right. just forcing yourself to love, How what's the first step to love? And this is fantastic. I love that. The first step to love is be thankful. Thank that thing. Because it's, it's neutral and you can do it. That's right. Well, the first step actually is to notice. It's to notice. And then to, then to, then to thank, then to notice its response. Because often we don't stop to notice the response. That's the, that's the three critical steps. So the, the noticing opens the door. The thanking takes you through the door. Ready for the next bit. And sometimes the chain as the noticing and thanking could be 40 minutes long. I had a uh, master practitioner contact me the other day and uh, she signed up to do the Quantum One program now after I had a talk to her. But she, she actually used one of my transcripts on a person with negative internal dialogue and only used the nosing and thanking process by itself. So imagine using an internal dialogue of noticing, thanking as an internal dialogue, with a negative internal dialogue. <laughs> well, interesting, isn't it? And she stayed with the person and just went through the step by step by step by step by step responses and 45 minutes later, ah, done. Now, I probably would have done some other intermediary things with all my toolkit 
that I've developed over the years, but nevertheless, it still worked. And she was amazed. No, but you're, but you're right, because, you know, in NLP, we know that uh, every behavior is a, is a process. So basically, there, is, there are steps that our inner computer is always taking. Mm. They're always little... Mm. Incremental steps. Incremental steps, steps, very tiny ones that are happening yeah. for something to happen from A to Z. So then mm. if we do this one by one or undo this one by one, then you actually can get through to the other side. This is how I That's see right. it when I'm hearing you. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's one model, and that's true for that model. There are other occasions when you don't even have to think it just processes through. So I started to wonder why do some things process automatically and why do some things require the noticing and thinking process, excuse me, the, particularly the thinking. And I pondered that for some months, and then a thought came to me, and this is how it always comes, as a thought comes, flashes through your mind and you catch those thoughts. The thought came to me, well, if you've made a conscious decision sometime in your history that that's how life was, that's how it is, or that's how it will be for me, then that requires a conscious agreement for the change to happen. If it's something you took on board unconsciously as a young child or a baby or somehow other way where you didn't actually make the decision, then it usually will process through automatically because it wasn't your decision in the first place. And that comes from a certain philosophy I have is that we're on a free will planet. And because we're on a free will, free will planet, we as conscious entities can have whatever reality we decide to have. So we can choose to have a dysfunctional or limiting belief and have the experience of life that that limiting belief gives to us. That's our right. But we can also choose to update that once we learn how to do that. That's also our right. So if we've made a decision sometime in the past, that's a free will decision. That might not, may not always feel like it at the time. So to undo a free will decision, we have to make another free will decision to undo that. Is reframing one of the ways to do that? To do what? Yeah, decide, take, make a new decision and undo oh. the past decision. Yes, yes, it can be. Uh, yes, it is because... You're not in a deep trance, so you're, you're making some conscious agreements to the process. But even if you go to a person who puts you in deep trance and the conscious mind is no longer engaged sometimes, the, uh, you've made that decision to go into the trance process. So you've basically given permission for the process to happen. So it happens at various levels. A lot of the change happens, of course, at the subconscious. The change has to happen at the subconscious level. Is it important to identify and to be very precise about the decision that we might have ah. taken in the past or not necessarily? Uh, no, not, not necessarily. You just have to give it permission to update. You don't necessarily need to remember. Sometimes you will. Uh, sometimes it, um, you won't. And again, I don't judge that. I just allow the, the, beings, the person's own system to, to allow that to happen in whatever way is exactly right for them. Um, and, of course, that also keeps you in rapport when you allow them to do it their particular way. But the other thing I want to say is sometimes the change can happen instantly or almost instantly rather than step by step by step by step. And I had one particular woman that uh, I'd, I'd seen, not, not as a client, but socially and in a meditation group a few times who was very, very stressed. You could tell by the drawn face and the muscles of the neck and everything was tight all the time. And, and after about three social type meetings with her, she hardly ever spoke to me. She happened to come to a, a group that I was running, a meditation group, which is really a processing group. We called it meditation, it made more sense to people. And she was there and everybody was sharing their experiences and um, she was always just looking, staring at the floor. And suddenly she said, I'm so angry, I'm so stressed, I'm really annoyed. And that's the first word she'd ever said in my presence. So obviously whatever we did brought something sufficiently, something changed sufficiently for action to actually say something. And I said to her, do you have a voice going on in your head? Just intuitively. And her eyes went like saucers as she snapped her head around to look straight at me, like big eyes. And she said, all the time. Nobody had ever asked her that question. 
And she'd been going to a city yoga group for years where they do chantings and all those sort of wonderful things that were just making her more and more and more angry. That's not meant to do that. So why did it make her more angry? Because the meditation of the chanting was supposed to somehow override or muffle or somehow diminish her internal dialogue, which is an implied judgment that her dialogue was her internal dialogue was bad or wrong. Her internal dialogue was not bad or wrong, it was just not very nice. It was just what it was what it was. So I've come to realise that chanting, if it's trying to subdue internal dialogue, negative internal dialogue, or affirmations, if they're trying to subdue affirmations or make somehow override them, if they're the wrong thought of affirmation, they'll actually make you more angry because it's a judgment on your current internal dialogue state. So I said, ah, oh, when she said, all the time. I, and I didn't ask her for content. I said, well, what's your internal dialogue like? So I was looking for the submodalities. So we went from the feelings of stress and anger, the kinesthetic, straight to the internal dialogue. So we, we swap uh, uh, representational systems. Because we cannot change easily an issue in the representational system that we're aware of. So she was aware of her feelings and emotions, but she wasn't aware consciously of internal dialogue till I asked the question. So I said, she said, oh, it's like Hitler haranguing his generals and yelling at the crowds and going on and on and on and on. Now, I'm not sure how many of the younger generation would know Hitler, but for my age, I remember seeing movies and things like that, particularly post-war stuff. And I thought, who would want to have that internal dialogue in their head constantly? And um, I said, oh. No, that wouldn't be very nice. No wonder you're angry and stressed. So I said, what would it be like if the internal dog was um, a cartoon character? She looked at me. I said, well, maybe Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Goofy. She said, no. I said, well, look, you sit there and you just close your eyes. I'm going to ask your brain to find a cartoon character or another character, it doesn't matter, whose voice you think is better than the one you've got. And it might like to find several voices that can use in different times. And I'm going to go and have a glass of water in the kitchen, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Just let your brain sort through all the voices that could be possible, the ones that are best for you. She said, okay. No longer angry. But as soon as we got the internal dialogue, no, got this, the, whole, the whole internal dialogue stopped, in fact. She was no longer stressed or angry. So I went to the kitchen, and her husband was there, and he thanked me very much. He said, that's the first time she's ever responded to anything that might work. And I said, well, and they've been and she said, we've been trying to have children and it's just not happening. I said, well, who'd want to bring a child into a world where Hitler is haranguing you all the time? The body would say, uh-uh, uh, not on. So he sort of nodded thoughtfully and we went, went back in. And she was a transformed woman. And I said, what happened? And like her face was bright and her eyes were shining and like all the muscles were relaxed, the shoulders and neck and everything. She was amazing, you know. I came up with the, the word, the voice of Mr. Magoo. Now, for those who don't know Mr. Magoo, he's an almost blind person wandering around the world, the you know, getting into all sorts of potentially disastrous situations where the universe sort of comes along and makes sure there's something for him there to take him to safety. And um, she said, Thanks very much. And she gave me a hug. She'd never done that before. And six months later, I heard she was happily three months pregnant. Wow. So that metaphor of the mind change happened instantly. So, yes, it sometimes takes step by step by step by step, and usually that happens when you haven't got found the metaphor of the mind. So it's not a bad process, it's just a slower process. And it's not always that easy to find the metaphor of the mind because that can be hidden way back in antiquity. That's very interesting, and uh, I, like, I like instant uh, shifts. I'm uh, very much a fan of that. Um, and I know that NLP can do lots of uh, miracles, let's call them like that, for lack of a better word. Well, even, yeah, well that's right, magic. Even the, um, 
even the nosing and thanking, there's, a, there's an immediate shift in the response. So there is an immediate immediacy to that. This might be a, a few more steps because you haven't got to what is, is, makes that almost instant massive change happen so quickly. But even the incremental steps. And for some people, they need the incremental steps. Because sometimes the physiology has to fo follow the cognitive changes, the images and the internal dialogue. And sometimes the physiological change is quite a significant change that needs to happen. And the, the kinesthetic, there's a lag time for it to, often for it to make those, those uh, adjustments. Yeah. We're almost reaching the end of our hour together today. Um, but oh, already? <laughs> yeah, it goes fast. I knew. That's why we, I took two appointments with you. I, uh, I managed to, to convince you to have two parts. <laughs> of the right, excellent. So excellent. we're going to meet again for the second part. But would you have uh, for today, uh, only if you have, and if you feel it's appropriate to do a little practice with me or with our viewers, something that they could start using right away as a practice for them to feel better? Well, when I, w I watched you um, interviewing Laura Spicer, yeah. and I think it was in the second, second part of that, because I watched that first, you mentioned that you were concerned about using um and ah when you're talking sometimes. Yes, yes. And we did discuss that a bit in our pre-interview. Um, and you also mentioned that you felt there's something in the throat chakra, a bit of a blockage. Yes. Right? So you, you did say you, you, you thought about doing some work with Laura about that, which I think is a good idea. But if you're willing, I'd like to just do a little exploration with that with you. Yeah. You can then apply to other things as well. Perfect. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you have some representation in your mind of what your throat chakra is like. You have a sense it has a colour? Purple. You close your eyes. Purple. Purple? purple? Yeah. Okay. okay. So just close your eyes and thank the throat chakra for showing that it's a purple in colour. When you thank it, what happens? Just open, you can keep your eyes closed and just tell me what happens. It vibrates. Good. So thank you for vibrating. When you do that, what happens? That's right. Yeah. So just thank it again. And then, then I'm just going to uh, talk to it for a moment and tell it that you have told me that you have a sense there's a bit of a blockage in the throat chakra. When I say that, how does it respond to that suggestion? It gives me another sensation. Mm -hmm. Which is? Which is a sort of a line, vibrating line that moves up like this. And it's not necessarily good, but it's not necessarily bad neither. But it is oh. like... Coming from the heart? No, it's coming just it's from the base of the throat. Okay. To the okay. Top. Okay, that's fine. So thank it for having that, that sensation that's coming from the top the throat to the top of the chest, mm -hmm. the other way. Now just notice what happens. As I invite your inner healer's loving joy to start flowing up towards your throat chakra in a very gentle, loving way to whatever degree is appropriate for your throat chakra to receive it. So whatever the blockage there might be there, and it could be in that part of the neck that you're gesturing with with your hand, just invite that loving inner healer energy to gently flow to the throat chakra through the passages, pathways of energy, channels of energy. So the throat chakra will receive healing from a healer so it can become more whole and healed and complete. Opening up any blockages, healing any pathways, any channels of energy so that your expression can be more and more clear, more and more free, Thank the throat chakra for receiving the healing energy to whatever degree it's willing and available at the moment. Knowing that process may continue to continue for some time, depending what it's about. And maybe it comes from a time in your past when you've prevented yourself from speaking your truth. I don't know that. You may or may not consciously know that. But your throat will know what caused it to become a little bit blocked. So just invite the inner healer to heal any memories from in the past when perhaps you didn't spell your truth, speak your truth as freely as you could have. Or perhaps you're made wrong in speaking your truth. I have plenty of That's right. memories. That's right. That's right. So just thank all that and just invite that process to continue, continue, 
for as long as it needs till the throat chakra becomes whole and healed and complete of any past memories and any physiological processes required as well. Any bodily shifts, any relaxation of the muscles, of the speech organs, whatever it is. And you're being fully satisfied that that process will continue to continue. Sometimes it might happen while you're sleeping and dreaming. Sometimes it happens gently in the background while you're doing other things. That's right. As you thank it for being willing to be part of that process of healing, thank your throat chakra. Thank your inner healer. Thank the pathways and channels of energy that allow the healing to happen. And thank any memories that might have come to mind. Times, places, events, people. Take as long as you need. And when you're being fully satisfied that that will continue to continue to full completion, then when you're ready, and when you're fully ready, allow your eyes to open from refreshed and energized, naturally and easily. Take as long as you need. Take as long as you need. So I felt lots of movement. There was lots of colors and there's lots of activity happening in this area. At a certain point, I felt, I felt my third eye and then there's my eyes moving and I was there just observing what's happening. I said, wow, this, there's something processed here and very interesting. Mm. I was completely dissociated from what was going on. Yeah. I was yeah. observing this process happening as if it was not happening yeah. to me, but I was witnessing a process going on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because by disassociating, you are not getting sucked into the emotions of what might have happened. You're just observing that that's processing. Yeah. And it's very strange. I have some little muscles pass in the muscles right here. <laughs> the body adjusting to the to the inner processing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's not bad. It's not painful. It's just it's flickering yeah. in the muscle. Right. So just you just thank it. That's all. Thank you. Just thank in your in your mind. Yeah. So well, it's, it's quite simple. Too. It, it's quite simple and it's quite easy when you know what to do like anything. Right? Unbelievable. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. Well, you, you can report back next time we meet of any changes you've noticed and if we need to, we can go a bit further next time. If I haven't changed my career as an opera singer by then, you know. <laughs> like my friend uh, Tess, yes, Jess, yes, yes. All right, so we can uh, wrap up our conversation today. So yeah, thank whatever is there. Thank the emotion. Thank the state that you're in. Uh, well, first of all, as Dick said, be aware. First step is to be aware. Notice what's happening. Take that time to be by uh, by yourself with yourself for a few moments. Yeah. We haven't. I mean, there are some, there are some books like uh, Conversations with God have helped people go through processes similar. There there are many other texts out there which come at it from a different angle conversations with god you meant by neil walsh yeah that's a that's a, a very good example of a, of a inner dialogue that is used uh, properly yep. yeah intelligently yep, yeah that's right. i'd like to talk more about uh, the, uh, the the quantum healing so to go a little bit deeper into that next time and i'd like to talk about reframing because that's very powerful i love reframing a lot so we have plenty on the list for next time we meet um good so Thank you so much, Dick, for being here with me today. I appreciate it. And for doing this exercise, I can't wait to see what's happening next with my, uh, my th throat chakra. Thank you for being willing to do it. It's always a pleasure to work with someone that works so easily and quickly. Well, yeah, I've, uh, I've experienced and um, we, we got to share a little bit last time. I uh, work a lot with myself, so I use a lot of my inner healing. Mm. But I like the way you presented it, and I haven't used it that way in a... Uh, it was more like an inner dialogue for me uh, in terms of uh, uh, a voice rather than mm -hmm. feelings. So I like to include them both now. I think it'll be, sure. yeah, will be more powerful that way. Mm. And um, yeah, so thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. We're going to, right after we finish uh, the recording here, we can discuss when we can meet again. So to everybody okay. watching, thank you uh, for, uh, for watching. Please subscribe and like, and of course, if you have something to say and want to have a conversation with me here and spread your message, clarify also what's important to you, contact me and uh, let's talk. So everybody, see you very soon.